Welcome to the Explore Words Discover Worlds podcast, presented by Bradford Literature Festival. In this episode, we explore the legacy of one of Yorkshire's most famous literary families, the Brontes. We are joined by a panel of accomplished authors who share their thoughts on how the Brontes' work inspired their own creativity and the family's lasting influence on popular culture. Tasha Suri, Isabel Greenberg and Shireen Malherb discuss their unique interpretations of the Brontes' work, chaired by the talented Sophia Raymond, guiding us through this fascinating discussion. Recorded live at the 2022 Bradford Literature Festival, this is a captivating exploration of the Brontes' family's legacy and the enduring influence of the family's literary output on modern popular culture. everyone. Thank you for joining us um, on this somewhat dreary morning, but I'm hoping that the conversation will brighten everyone's mornings up. So I'm Sophia Rahman, I'm your host, and we have with us today Isabel Greenberg. She is a London-based author and illustrator, interested in all things folktale, mythology, and the Brontes. She's the creator of three graphic novels, The Encyclopedia of Early Earth and The 100 Nights of Hero, which were both New York Times graphic books bestsellers. And most recently, she has uh, illustrated and authored Glass Town. She's also the illustrator of a number of children's books and is a lecturer at Camberwell College of Art. Next, we have Shireen Malherbe. She is a British-Palestinian author. After spending over a decade living uh, throughout the Middle East, she now resides in England with her husband and four children. Shireen's debut novel, Jasmine Falling, has been voted amongst the best books by Muslim women, and her second, The Tower, has become academic set text in a un US university. Her short story, The Cypress Tree, was published in World Literature World Literature Today's landmark edition, Palestine Voices. Her latest novel, The Land Beneath the Light, a Palestinian reimagining of Jane Eyre, has been nominated for the Palestine Book Awards 2022. And then finally, but not leastly, we have Tasha Suri. She is an award-winning author of fantasy novels. Her first young adult novel, What Souls Are Made Of, a remix of Wuthering Heights, is out in July. Actually, each of you have your beautiful books in your hands. Why are you not holding them up? There we go. <laughs> she, is, she is a writing tutor and an occasional librarian and, of course, most importantly, a cat owner. When she isn't writing, Tasha likes to cry over TV shows, buy too many notebooks, and indulge her geeky passion for reading about South Asian history. She lives with her family in a mildly haunted house in London. I feel like I should have talked to you about this okay. <laughs> afterwards. So, let's get cracking. So, um, I'd like each of you to please, if you don't mind, just introduce to the audience um, each of your books and your, sort of, your journey to, to writing them. So, Isabel, if I could start with you. Um, so, um, Glass Town is a, a graphic... <coughs> um, a graphic um, adaptation, I suppose, um, of... Um, it sort of mixes the biography of the four Bronte ch children and um, investigates their juvenilia. So um, obviously a lot of people are very familiar with their novels, um, but the juvenilia is a, a vast body of work that they made um, when they were beginning when they were quite young and going up until they were sort of in their late teens and 20s. Um, and it's all set in this vast, fantastical, imaginary um, world. Um, and so my graphic novel um, explores... Um, ideas of uh, creation and um, world building and fantasy, but through the eyes, through the through the Bronte siblings and how they came to create these worlds. Mm. And how did you come to to, to creating this this book? Um, so I was a fan of the Bronte's novels um, growing up, and um, also big fan of. BBC costume dramas, mm. um, obviously. Um, so I was very like aware of the Brontes sort of canon, um, but I'd never really felt a particular need to adapt it myself until I came across the Juvenalia, and it it felt so visual to me um, as a as a concept. And I'm my previous graphic novels are sort of quite world building, fantastical things, and so 
my interest in the juvenilia was definitely through um, through world building, really. Mm. Um, lots. Of, I think people say that sort of Glasstown, Angry and Gondol, which are the Bronte's imaginary worlds, are like one of the very earliest examples of the kind of fant fantasy world building that we would, you know, like uh, recognise, like sort of Tolkien kind of thing. Mm. But they did it like way earlier than Tolkien. They they beat him to it. Um, but not so many people, I guess, are aware of that part of their um, work and. <clears throat> Graphic novels are obviously very visual and mm. it felt like a really fantastic thing to explore through that medium, mm. I think. Lovely. Uh, I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about that later on. Shireen, could you introduce your book to us? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, this is The Lamb Beneath the Light. It's a Palestinian reimagining of Jane Eyre and it's set in modern-day Palestine. Um, I stayed with my family in a rural um, house in uh, a small village in Palestine and it was one of the most gothic places I'd ever been. It was literally one road in, one road out, um, surrounded by the occupation and because it's high in the hilltops it's, it's covered in mist um, and be, the lives that are lived there are very rarely seen so uh, I wanted to also alongside the setting have a really intimate female-centric story, um, and that's why I decided to do a Palestinian reimagining of Jane Eyre. Mm, lovely, thank you. And Tasha, how about your book? Yes, so um, I'll hold it up again just for a moment. Uh, um, what Souls Are Made Of is a remix of Wuthering Heights, and what that means is that um, essentially I was contacted by a publisher a little while ago because I'm established in adult fantasy novels, um, about writing as part of um, a series called the Remix Classic Series. And the Remix Classic Series is a series of YA books published in the US where they asked authors from diverse backgrounds um, to take classic novels and remix them. So take elements of them, take story um, plot points and themes, and take the time setting that those stories were set in and tell a diverse story in any way that the author wanted to. Um, and I love Wuthering Heights. I've always loved Wuthering Heights. I was a dramatic goth teenager, so mm -hmm. I was delighted to take Wuthering Heights and, and do my own thing with it. Um, and my uh, remix is very close to the original in a lot of ways, but it's um, in the original Heathcliff, who is um, one of the two main protagonists, is not white. He's explicitly not white, but what he is is unclear. He's described by about five different race race possibilities, but he is not explicitly any of them. Um, and I really wanted to give him roots. I was really interested in the fact that in Gothic fiction and as a narrative tradition, there's a lot of othering and um, of people who are racialized in fiction. Mm. So um, in my remix, Heathcliff is the son of Alaska or a South Asian sailor. And Kathy, his love interest, um, is the daughter of an East India Company officer. So it let me really play with talking about how much British Empire sucked, which is always my favourite topic. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely, and we shall definitely return to, to this point. Um, before we do that, though, I was interested in um, sort of knowing about your, your own first encounters with the Brontes and specifically the stories that Tasha and Shireen that you've um, reimagined or, or remixed. I like that. I'm, I'm intrigued by this term, remix, as well. And Isabel, obviously, the juvenilia that you've brought to life through, through yours. So could you talk to us a little bit about your first encounter with, with the Brontes, which character in their world first gripped you? What, what, what attracted you first to the Brontes and, and why? Yeah, so I guess uh, the juvenilia for me, what attracted me to it wasn't so much the characters in it. Um, I don't know if anyone has read any of it, but it's quite hard going. It's not, um, it's not, a pace, it's not pacey, mm -hmm. um, it's not an easy read, but what fascinated me about it was more the story of its creation. So this idea of these four children um, living in this very rural setting and they'd experienced some you know, extreme tragedy in their lives already. Two of their siblings had died, their mother had died. And it's just, it seemed like such a sort of overwhelmingly evocative image mm. and then they sort of sat down and they created things together and so this world that they built just these four children um and how immense it was and detailed and vast and so for me what drew me to the juvenilia wasn't sort of a particular character but it was more the way that it came to life mm. um and it's sort of inception story mm. i think 
Um, so the yeah. storytelling almost was its own kind of character. Yeah, mm. and I think what I was really interested in was this relationship between, um, and obviously as a writer, I'm always interested in the relationship between the writer and their creations. Mm. Um, and um, there's a, when Charlotte was a teacher at Rowhead School, she um, wrote these diaries um, describing her time there. And when you read them, she really does seem to have slightly lost her grip on reality. Like, mm. it feels like when you're reading them, you're like, wow, you... She sort of jumps from reality to glass town, to reality to glass town in this, like, really sort of fluid way. And I think one of the things I really wanted to explore in the book was this idea of a writer losing themselves in their own characters mm. and how dangerous can that be if it goes too far. Mm. I'm not sure if I lost your question there somewhere. No, that's <laughs> fine, but you've intrigued me with another one. You've inspired <laughs> another one. So I'm just wondering, um, to lose oneself in one's character, is it only ever dangerous? I think reading the, the way that they immerse themselves in their own world, I, I wish I could write like that. Mm. And I wonder if it's only possible if you come to your writing from a place like they were coming to it. Mm. And I... I don't know if it's, like, trite to say, like, in this modern world with all these distractions that we have. <laughs> but, like, yeah, they would not have yeah. been, you know, had another browser tab open with, um, yeah. like, internet shopping kind of yeah. thing. Um, I don't know. And But when I... I think what uh, fascinated me was just how involved they were in these mm -hmm. worlds and they were so real to them. There's these descriptions of Emily and Anne, like, as adults taking a train, um, I can't remember, I think they're going from Leeds or something on the train, and they're play-acting as the characters, like, as adults, they're just, they're, they're, they're still doing these fantasy games that you lose, that I think you lose, the, yeah. you lose when you grow up, and they kept hold of them, yeah. and that's kind of magical. And yet there's so much now to tell us that as, as adults, that, that lost art of play is really important to, to find our way back to. So that's fascinating. Mm. Thank you. Shireen, what about you, your first encounter with the Brontes? Um, well, like Isabel, really, it was that real mix between the reality of the character and their imaginary world and the world that existed around them. I found that really hard to separate, and I love writing like that. Mm. I think it has a more deeper, rich way of storytelling mm -hmm. when reality, memories, storytelling, history and um, sort of the unseen world exists around them. So for me, Jane Eyre encompasses that with mm -hmm. the ethereal nature of how she's described as elfin-like or there's lots of gothic supernatural events. Um, so the whole mood of it is that mix between reality and this world that they're creating. And I think with storytelling, that you know really does make a very rich experience. Um, I also love Wuthering Heights. Um, and I love the connection with the land. And because the novel is uh, Palestinian, a lot of people ask, why do people stay in Palestine? Um, and that connection to the land is absolutely key. Um, in what I've experienced as a reason why people stay. Mm. So to have those elements together, for me, it was almost essential <laughs> that mm. I combine the two to make a Palestinian reimagining of mm. Jane Eyre. I mean, I remember us um, having a conversation, and I know that all of us were struck by this um, sort of insight that you gave us from your own experience of visiting this family home of yours in Palestine and then you know, going to find this little village or, you know, yeah. place on a map, and it wasn't there. Yeah, so uh, the first thing when I do research uh, or when I have a, a, an idea of a novel is obviously you go and research. So the first thing you do is go on Google, <laughs> have a look, uh, reacquaint yourself with the location, the place, have a look at the street view, see see if your memory serves you correctly. And actually, when I came to research the town, it didn't exist on satellite maps. Mm. And that was really key for me because it does exist and my family live there and there's life there. Mm. You know, they have hopes and aspirations and dreams and these female lives really go unseen. I mean, if when I visited Palestine with my husband, we were walking down the streets in Jericho and a tourist bus pulled up and all the tourists piled off, took a photo of a tree, um, 
that was um, a famous tree, I believe uh, Jesus was supposed to have sat under it. And then they piled on the bus and went away. And at that moment, I realized even if you're blessed enough to visit Palestine, you still don't really see the real Palestine. Uh, so for me, it was key to capture it because it's also about their history and my family history mm -hmm. and because the land changes so much under occupation at an alarmingly fast rate mm -hmm. what i was concerned about is who is capturing our history mm -hmm. and we look at the brontes now we look at their novels and they're this really intimate perspective of female domestic lives in essence in 19th century society and without their contribution we wouldn't have spent the last however many years analyzing what life was like for women or what they experienced, what their hopes were and what their dreams were. And so that contrast with how I felt about my grandmother's stories, um, you know, was so aligned with what I felt, what the Bronte's work gave us mm. that it, it made sense to, to do a reimagining in this setting. Mm. That's lovely. Thank you. And Tasha, if I can come to you. So your first encounter with the Bronte's. Uh, funnily enough, I mean, considering I wrote a remix of Wuthering Heights, I, like Shireen, started with Jane Eyre. Um, <laughs> I really love Jane Eyre. I really related mm. to her. You know, this girl who didn't want to go outside and just wanted to read books and, you know, hated everyone and had a tantrum in a room. Um, <laughs> it, it really spoke to me. Um, but then, as I got a little older, I thought, oh, I'm going to try and read the other Brontes. Mm. And somebody said to me, oh, don't read Wuthering Heights. It's really overdramatic and everybody and it's awful. Um, and it's only for teenage girls. So of course I read it, um, <laughs> and I loved it, and I became a bit of a passionate defender of it because mm. I think it's actually a very sophisticated novel. I think mm. it gets done down a lot mm. as a, a novel of um, passion about people who are awful. And it is a novel of passion about people mm. who are awful, um, but it's also the story of two people told through the perspective of another person who knew them, told to somebody else who then tells us. Um, mm. So there's loads of kind of uh, uh, ambiguity, which I really like, which I think is very modern. Um, and I also really loved, when I read it as a, as a young teenager, um, being aware that Heathcliff probably looked possibly more like me than, he, than anybody else I'd read in classic fiction. Um, and I remember getting into real arguments about this because I was that kind of child. <laughs> um, because I watched things like adaptations of it, and he was always white, apart from um, Andrea Arnold's 2011 adaptation. Um, and I said, he's not white. He's clearly not white in the story, so why is he always depicted as white? And I think that was one of my first inklings, that one, there had always been people of colour in Britain and in our, in, mm. in our history, that this is our history, but also that um, history is often erased. Um, and I was always fascinated by that and always wanted to explore that a little bit more in my own writing and then to be able to do that through Wuthering Heights was really, mm. really nice. Mm. So you've all sort of taken us into the, my next question, so it all segues really nicely. Um, sort of retellings of classics have become sort of an established genre in their, in their own right now. Um, and it seems like there's no limit to the number of retellings, reimaginings and remixes um, of classics that can be weaved in with sort of new perspectives, new, new contexts. I, was, I, I really wanted to know what each of you thought was the appeal of the stories of the Brontes especially that invites authors to repeatedly return to them and to you know bring them to new audiences with new perspectives um, how have you made these stories your own in your reimagining um, why not write the stories that you wanted to tell in a new and innovative storyline of your own why why to why to the Brontes? Why the reimagining? And actually, can I start with you so that you can tell us a little bit? <laughs> yeah, you know, I see you. you know, um, uh, can, we, can we talk about um, what is the difference between remixing the story and reimagining it? Mm -hmm. uh, because it feels very deliberate, that word. So I'm just wondering if there's something behind that. There was. I think when the, the series first started, it was called um, a retelling series. And mm. a few of the authors involved, and I won't name any of them in particular, um, it wasn't me, I'm not that clever, um, were saying... A retelling suggests that we are doing exactly what the original authors did, mm. but just putting uh, 
putting a tan on a few characters or, yeah. or making some of them queer. And that didn't seem to be exactly what we wanted to do. That was not what any of us were going into these stories to do. And um, the Remix Classes series is, um, not to pick it up, really worth looking at because we've all taken such different approaches. So, for example, somebody did Treasure Island, but on the South China Seas... Um, with you know young girls because there was in a particular um, there was a particular pirate who was a woman Ching Shi I don't think I said her name correctly who was a really important figure so it it was a completely different context even in the same era um, whereas I've stayed much closer to home but what we all agreed that we were doing was not retelling we were taking elements and mm. motifs and plot points as a jumping off point to tell a story that was inherently very different because it wasn't centering um, a certain cis, white, heteronormative narrative. Now, we've all done different things. So obviously, I'm telling a story of um, a girl and a boy falling in love. But it, it's that we needed space to have, to reimagine, I guess. Mm. Um, and remix fits really well because it's taking bits and remixing them, essentially. Mm. It, it just felt right. Um, and I think... I, I actually went to a school and did a talk about this book. And one of the students, because they're really smart, um, said to me, don't you feel like you're just um, reifying those older books? Because if the whole point is that you're trying to tell stories that are different, why are you going back to these stories that, you know, codified things like racialized otherness and, you know, talked about British imperialism like it was good? And I said, because I'm still writing in English mm -hmm. and I'm still writing in a Western tradition. So I can't escape the things that came before um, I have to respond to them in some way because that's the tradition I'm writing in. Perhaps even if I were writing, say, in Hindi or Urdu, I would still possibly have to respond to those things. But right now in the space I'm in, I do have to kind of engage with them. And also I want to because mm. um, it's, I think it can be easy sometimes um, to say, oh, everything sucked and I'm putting that aside and I'm writing something new. But it's, it's a very nuanced and complex relationship. Mm. I love the Brontes. I love Jane Eyre. I actually love... Um, Anne's work as well, but I've forgotten the name of the book, which is really bad. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I really love Wuthering Heights, and they've given me a lot, and I value them a lot, but that I think it's also very empowering and important to look at these stories that have elements that, you know, as part of a narrative tradition are problematic or can be questioned or should be rigorously, critically analysed. And to be able to do that, um, that's fun to me, I guess. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Shireen? That's fun for me as well. <laughs> but yeah, I think um, by doing a classic, it was the same. I didn't want to do a retelling, um, and I came, this is a Palestinian reimagining, because like you said, it gives you that creative license. Mm -hmm. um, we don't just want to tell the same story. I want to use elements that are really strong um, to tell our stories. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Now, the reason that I chose a classic that is read around the world is because a lot of my writing is based in uh, Islamic theology. And sometimes that can pigeonhole the writing where mm -hmm. people say, oh, it might not be for me. And what I found incredible is that the Brontes is steeped in Christian theology, and yet it's universal. So these human uh, decisions, feelings, emotions, this connection you have to any belief system that... Um, informs how characters make decisions is really key. Mm. And, and so I wanted to do sort of a direct reimagining of, of a classic to say this is accessible. If you're human, then, you know, you're going to understand these characters and the decisions they make. And it does also feed into how... Um, the West traditionally frames the East. We still have huge issues with Orientalism, with how certain issues and tropes, as Tasha was saying, uh, were in the classics, are in the classics, and even now in new books is still an issue. So by using a classic, you get the opportunity to flip that and say, here is this perspective of the East that you may not have actually read before, discovered, or experienced. And by using the theology base of the characters, what you're doing is you're allowing that experience to be deeper and richer and then be more understood. So you understand why a young girl in Palestine is making the decision she's making. You understand what she's going through. And it builds that empathy, which I think is essential for humanity. If we stay on the outside 
constantly reinforcing these tropes because it's easier, you're missing a whole rich depth of human experience. So by using this imagination, this mix of their reality, um, as Isabel was saying, you know, their worlds were combined with their thoughts, their memories, their histories. I wanted to use that directly, and that is exactly why I chose Jane Eyre. Um, because in essence, many, I mean, I think um, most story plots, there's actually only seven, the journey story, <laughs> the coming of age, there's not that many. Um, so in essence, we're all retelling other people's mm. stories. Um, so Jane Eyre, in essence, is a coming of age plot about a young girl and her struggles to womanhood. So I think no matter what era it is or what time, you know, those stories are going to be relevant for new audiences. Mm. Um, and I think that, you know, it can be shared by anybody who reads literature and wants to explore and wants to just go into another world. Mm. Um, so that's why, for me, the classic was so important in this mm. reimagining. So there's something that both of you have kind of revealed in your answers, and that's that as much as you love the stories that you are retelling, there's a tension there as well. There are, there are many tensions, in fact. So I wonder if you could, each of you, talk to, talk to us a little bit about your research process. Because I think when we look at re, re, retellings of a story, we think, well, how difficult is that? Because you've already got the story there, and you're just changing a little bit here and there to give us a new version. But actually, the process is quite complex. So could you talk to us a little bit about the research process that goes into this, um, the tensions that you run up against, and how you navigate actually the gaps that there are in history as well, because there are often blank spaces in, in, in history and you are dealing with, the, with the historical figures as well. Maybe I could start with you, Isabel. Uh, yeah, I think I, prior to this book, I'd really only done sort of fantastical stuff, so having to sort of do research that was... Um, so, I guess, researchy <laughs> um, was, was quite, I guess, new um, for me in my process. But I've never actually enjoyed doing a book as much as I enjoyed this one. And I found the research, in, you know, incredibly inspiring. Like, I visited the parsonage several times and um, I found it to be a really um, incredibly, like, magical and moving place. Mm -hmm. And um, the first time I went, I, I, yeah, I was genuinely very moved by it as a, as a place that they had been and lived um but i think the problems i found with the juvenilia was that it's such a vast body of work and there's so much intriguing material in there um but it couldn't all go in um mm. because it would have been a mad book <laughs> <laughs> um if i had tried to keep it all in so i think for me it was deciding what was going to stay and what was going to go and the biggest thing that i had to leave out was emily and Anne's entire imaginary world um mm. because having a book with two imaginary worlds and um, would have been quite hard to keep a, keep a hang, handle on, really. Um, so I chose to focus on Charlotte's imaginary world, Glass Town, because there was a lot more material left over. Um, Emily and Anne's world, there's poetry left, but there's very little prose. Um, mm. So I stuck with Charlotte's world. Um, and, yeah, I had to say goodbye to a lot of material that I'd got very, very attached to. Um, but it was exciting, and for me, one of the exciting parts of the book was of making the book was deciding which parts of the juvenilia I wanted to keep and which of the mm. characters I felt were interesting and relevant. And um, yeah, I think there was a lot of stuff in there. They were young mm. children who were obsessed with what was going on in the world beyond them, and so they were fascinated by the British Empire, and the, they f were very they saw it as a grand, romantic, wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. You know, all these great British soldiers going out there, taking over. They <laughs> loved it. And so that is quite troublesome as a modern reader. You're like, oh, no, I love the Brontes, but that's not good. Why can't they be, why can't they be better? And so for me, it was hard deciding what of that, uh, of the more distasteful colonial stuff to leave in and what to leave out. And it didn't seem fair to me to pretend that they had been these right. perfect people. Um, so, but I also didn't feel equipped to make it the central theme of my book. Uh, so I sort of chose to deal with that by keeping in some of the characters of colour that they had written. But um, I will say that, yes, I changed the plot lines quite extensively. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it was an interesting process. And I think, um, I think you guys would be very fascinated by the juvenilia actually yeah. and I'd love you 
I'd love to see it remixed, actually, again, more. <laughs> yeah. Um, Tasha, would you like to tell us about your research process and sort yes. of the questions that you ran up against? Yeah, so um, in, in Wuthering Heights itself, um, Heathcliff is called a, a little Lascar, among a lot of other things. So I knew that in the time that Emily Bronte set the book, there were Lascars. There had to be, because she knew they existed. Um, I'd also, I also knew that there were children of East India Company officers from the 17th, 18th century onwards, 18th century, um, who were brought to Britain if they were white passing and raised in Britain. There were also ones who were not white passing who were left behind, so that's great. Um, so I knew all of that before I went in. And I thought, 18th century, this is going to be a doddle. There's so much information about the 18th century. <laughs> you know, if you think that um, you're, you're about to, you hit the Napoleonic Wars and like mm -hmm. the, the ton and Regency romances and stuff, I was like, I'm going to find loads. And then I realized I was writing about um, multiracial working class communities in port cities. <laughs> and uh, there was very little. Um, and that was extremely annoying. So, for example, when I started looking up how long there had been Lascars coming to the UK, so South Asian, Southeast Asian, um, partly North African, um, and a few other places, basically any sailor who wasn't white was considered Lascar to some extent. Um, sailors coming to the UK and going back and forth and working on ships. And I was like, how long have they been coming? They weren't very good records for a long time. They just were no records, nobody checked. Mm -hmm. um, then they started tracking things, so people started lying because they were cheaper to pay for, so they just didn't track them. So it wasn't until the 19th century that we have good records, um, which made my life really difficult because it became very hard to find out where they had potentially been abandoned, where they had settled. Um, there wasn't a mosque in Liverpool till the 19th century, and I thought, well, that's a bit weird. If there was an immigrant community of Muslim sailors, they probably had some kind of mosque, mm -hmm. couldn't find any evidence of it. I knew there was a Chinese community in Liverpool, but I couldn't find out where they lived. So it was, it was a constant um, push or a, a wall of lack of records where, for whatever reason, records had... Well, we know the reason. Records hadn't been preserved or hadn't been created in the first place. So I had to do a lot of guesswork in mm. what I was writing um, because there just wasn't any information there for me to draw on. Uh, and I also found that there were often kind of outright lies, which was interesting. So um, as part of the story, I have Heathcliff go to Liverpool where he meets other children who are not white, other teenagers. And at least one of them was um, a black person who'd been enslaved but had run away. Arguably, at the time I've set the story, slavery was illegal on British soil. There were no slaves. You can read multiple books and they'll go, no slaves, there were no slaves here at all. Um, but there's a really good project by um, Glasgow University where they talked about the history of enslaved people in the UK. And they have um, newspaper, news press, art um, records showing um, adverts looking for escaped slaves. Mm. So even at the time that it was illegal, according to all history books on British soil, people were still being enslaved and treated as slaves. Mm. Um, and it was just a constant brush with the fact that if you move outside of a certain branch of history a lot of things are just not tracked or not recorded or not true, which is complicated. Mm. But it was really fascinating to get to kind of investigate it and mm. come up with my own story around that. So mm. I really enjoyed that. And if you are interested in that topic, there's a book by an author called Rosina Vistram um, called Asians in Britain, and it is amazing. She went into um, archives and did all the research herself. It's an invaluable resource, very readable. And I'll leave it at that. That's amazing. I mean, it, it, you've illustrated really well there that, yes, there are tensions, but out, that, those tensions are potentially generative. So there are opportunities that fiction allows, and especially in these retellings, to address some of oh, those yeah, yeah. I mean, inconsistencies. 1786 in was a bad time. There, was no, there were no unions. Everyone had really bad working conditions. There was no hope, as far as I could see in any record I read. I was like, no hope, Napoleonic War, some hope after. Um, but I thought, I just don't think people lived like that. I mean, I know the world is often terrible, but I think generally... People try and create good things for themselves, for their families, for the people they care about, for their communities. And I know that later the wives of Lascars would, um, you know, who were largely working class women who were ostracized by their communities for marrying out, 
um, were advocating for their husbands. Mm. So I knew that was a thing. I knew that existed later. And I thought, there's no reason it, it di didn't exist then. Yeah. Um, just because we don't have the records doesn't mean that they want people fighting for better for themselves and for the people they loved. So I had to bring that in. That was, mm. in that tension, I could let that kind of mm. bloom, I guess. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you so much. And Shireen, if I could ask you the same question. Um, yeah, I think it's really interesting how Tasha said there's, there's gaps and that you're getting the opportunity to fill it in because isn't that what happened with the Brontes? They had, um, you know, we look at their novels for a snapshot of, a, of that century, that era. And yet at the time, people that read novels, they'd be like, oh, you're reading a novel, how lovely, you know, <laughs> what a silly pastime. Um, and yet now we're using those novels because people say to me, oh, why don't you do nonfiction? Why do you choose the novel itself? And that's because it does allow history to be captured in a way that isn't um i'm not going to say bias non-fiction has its place but not everybody reads non-fiction and if you have a novel then you can explore things on a deeper basis like you said it might not be records about the wives sticking up for their husbands or people trying to do good but in a novel you're more likely to get those types of stories you're more likely to empathize and understand the decisions that individuals make in a society um, so for me, my research process was quite different. I took the coming of age plot um, and uh, some of the main plot themes that worked with the story I was trying to tell, the themes of birds and freedom, um, the things that really worked for my Palestinian reimagining. I used everything else I completely left out. Um, but f So for my research, it was how do you make something that's quintessentially British, a gothic story, set in Palestine? That was my first sort of, oh, we can't do that, you know. British Gothic stories are on the moors in these haunted houses. And then I remember when we visited Palestine, the architecture there was Gothic. There was a house that um, I believe one of my uh, uncles owned, and it had big arch windows. It was grand and dark and just how you'd imagine Gothic architecture to be. So I started researching, and I came across Diana Dark's book, Stealing from the Saracens. She's a historian. And um, she's wrote a whole book about how British Gothic architecture was actually taken from the East. It was taken from Arab architects. It was taken from existing architecture that was already in the Arab world. So actually, this quintessentially British setting was not that British. And actually, it really was reflected in the places that I stayed in Palestine. So that really gave me the confidence to say, OK, so we've still got some issues with where this quintessentially British aspect comes from. And let's, let's use that and let's um, put that in Palestine because those worlds, they're actually not that far apart. Mm, incredible. Um, so we've talked lots about your books. Let's get a little reading from each of you, if that's possible. Who else? Isabel, can I start uh, with you? Yes, I have to get it up on or the Or I'll tell you what, let's so start with um, Shireen and, and tinkle the technology. Yes. Sorry, Shireen, if you could give us just a little bit of context as well, an explanation, yes. Thanks. Okay, so it's really, really hard to choose a section from the book. Uh, so I've gone for a section um, because we've already discussed how creating a world around, um, around the character that includes things that we can't see or hear and how that influences her. Um, okay, so this is near the beginning of the book and it's giving you a bit of background about the character. She's not called Jane, she's called Khadija. <laughs> so um, this is just a little bit of background on her. When Khadija appeared, she remembered being about five years old. She asked how she had come to get the scar on her forehead because she couldn't remember that couldn't remember that either. It had been a childhood accident, her mother said. All Palestinian children had scars. So, for Khadija, there was nothing that began before it that she could ever recall. Of course, like any normal child, she asked her mum to tell her about the day she was born and how she was as a baby, but the few stories her mum told her didn't always make sense. She asked if she had a father, but the way her mother spoke of that made her sure that he was dead, because she never spoke as, of him as if he was absent or working away like some other fathers she knew. He just did not exist, and Khadija was just there. 
Hadija felt that she was possibly only half human in the sense that she did exist, just not as complete and whole as everyone around her. She felt more like the shapeshifters in the stories she had heard about, the unseen amongst the living. Khadija thought of the unseen. She was never alone, her mother often said. When they prayed, angels stood beside them. She often glanced behind her shoulder to see if the air moved differently, or afterwards she scoured the clean bare floors for emeralds, rubies or diamonds that fell from their wings. But so far, she had found nothing. Take me with you, she would whisper. Take me far from here. Khadija's thoughts were interrupted by the sudden onset of birds tweeting and rustling in the trees. She went outside and climbed to her favourite spot in the house, the flat roof that provided her with a vista of her street in the fields. She often spent time watching the birds. Crows and finches clustered in the trees. The hummingbirds were her favourite with their tiny bodies and beautiful bright colours. She often watched them drinking nectar from sweet flowers. There was another bird she had seen, but she wasn't sure if it was real or not. Sometimes she believed she caught sight of the bird in the tree outside her window. It never chirped or frolicked with the others. It just sat there amidst the highest branches, camouflaging itself in the leaves. But through the dark green, Khadija could see that it wasn't like the rest. She often wondered where this bird was from. It was like a bird of paradise, she had read. The martyrs were not dead. Their souls lived in the bellies of green birds in paradise. In Palestine, there were many green birds. She didn't know why the grown-ups kept saying that. She had only caught sight of its wing or its body in the trees, but she was never quite sure it was that bird. The green bird she had seen in books belonged to faraway places that she had never been to, like the rainforest or the d jungles. But still, she searched, sure that one day she would see the flock of green heavenly birds everyone spoke of so often, had it flown in over the hilltops and never left. Khadija knew when she was grown up she would fly far, far away and see what the world looked like beyond her village. She would be like the birds. She would be free to go anywhere and then she could find her place in the world where people might one day know her name. She knew she didn't have the money to travel, but if all the stories were true, there was nothing that would stop her from achieving her dreams. She was almost old enough for school. She had heard stories of those who studied hard enough, won scholarships, became doctors, traveled the world, and saved lives. Her eyes lit up at the thought. Her mind had traveled with the birds past the hilltops, over the mountains, and to a place where she was somebody. Perhaps that somebody would be... A doctor Khadija. Oh, thank you. So I chose that bit because that part of the story doesn't give too much away, <laughs> and also it it tries to sort of show that ethereal feel that the books that um, Jane Eyre creates, that are the element that I loved in those other books, and it gives you that combination of her imagination her storytelling the history of the land through what she experiences in her reality um, and it also shares with you a little bit about her dreams she's a very um, poor girl in a rural village but she has big dreams of becoming a doctor lovely thank you so much Shireen. Isabel if I can talk to you um, so <clears throat> I don't usually do readings because it's um yeah. graphic novel so I don't know how this is going to go this might be a bit weird and it's quite dialogue heavy so I don't know if I should like do voices or not um, I'm just going to like <laughs> see voices, what happens this. roll with it <laughs> um, I've picked three small sections to try and show how um, because the book has sort of three plot lines that run concurrently there's the world of Glastown there's the world of Charlotte in her present day remembering Glastown and at that point she's the last of the Brontes left alive um, and she's remembering her childhood and how they created the world. So there's three plot strands running at the same time, and in order to try and help the reader differentiate between them, I kind of chose different colour palettes and stuff. So uh, let's just see how this goes. And if I go on, if it, I'm not sure how long it's going to take either, so I'll just stop if I talk too much. Uh, so this is the children building the world. Um, and so they began to build. They took from all the books on their father's bookshelf, Gulliver's Travels, Blackwood's Journals, the poetry of... Byron and Southie, the dazzling tales of the 1001 Nights and the fire and brimstone of the Old Testament. They cut and stuck, wrote and crossed out, scribbled and drew. Um, how about this bit? Excellent. And this bit. Let me... <laughs> the, the children are speaking. I'm going to fix the next slide. Um, 
and this is the glass town that they've sort of built. Um, oh, what a marvelous thing we've built. Um, what shall we call it, Tali? Glass town. Um, so now I've skipped forward a little bit, and this is uh, Charlotte talking to her imaginary character, Charles, um, about this, this world and um, reminiscing about it. A new class cast of glass towners had arrived. The twelves, though venerated as founding, finding, founding fathers, had been consigned to become great marble statues in the hall of ideas past. The four genie had new people to take care of. If I might interject, Miss Bronte, interject. Yes, I think now might be a good time to meet our cast. Over there, do you see her, the fearsome Lady Zenobia, the finest mind in the whole of Angria, and the founder of the Glasstown Blue Stocking Society? And seated there, that is Kwashia Quimina, King of Ashanti. And here, this is Mary Percy and her father, the Earl of Northangerland. And of course, Arthur Wellesley, Zamorna, my brother. Uh, and so I'll read now a little section from uh, Charlotte's time at Rowhead School. Um, so this is when she starts to lose her grip on reality a little bit. Um, and um, so she's talking to Anne here uh, because Emily has uh, been sent home with homesickness, couldn't hack it, so they've sent Anne back in her place. Uh, within months, Emily's homesickness was so extreme that she had gone back to Haworth and Anne had been sent to take over her place. It's not so bad here, Anne. You shall bear it. I expect I shall. Try to concentrate on being here. Emily's head was always in Haworth. Or Gondol. Yes, precisely. I do not allow myself to think of Glastown. You must stay in the present, Anne. Mary Taylor said to me once that we four, you and Emily and Bran and I, were like potatoes living in a dark cellar. What a horrible remark. But it rings true, doesn't it? And do you manage, Charlotte, to keep thoughts of Glastown at bay? Yes, I try. This could not have been further from the truth. In fact, something had begun to creep over Charlotte in these last few months. It's as though the world I inhabit, this real world of darning and arithmetic and French verb conjugations, has ceased to be as real to me as that other world, the infernal beautiful world of Glastown. I clutch glimpses of Zamorna at the edge of my vision, a cloak disappearing around a corner, a shadow passing across a sunlit window. I try desperately to see him. Miss Bronte? Yes, Miss Wooler? Would you go and supervise the girls' dinner, please? Of course, right away. Every wrench back to reality has become more painful. I stop trying to shut it out. I begin to write frantically, Zamorna, always Zamorna. Once in the middle of lessons, I think I see him through a window, striding boldly across the lawn towards me. Miss Bronte? Behind him, the grey Yorkshire hills fade away, and there is Glastown. Golden towers and crystal windows, the tropical sky burning a merciless fierce blue, and the palm trees still in the breezeless air. Zamorna. Miss Bronte. What? What is it, Lucy? Are you well, Miss Bronte? Your face has gone pale and you were writing with your eyes closed. What were you writing? Nothing. Nothing at all. Um, is that the time? Off you go now. Uh, um, should I... Uh, I'll just flick through these last pages, I won't read them. But um, this is Zamorna um, sticking his head out of the trunk and inviting Charlotte to um, <laughs> sort of jump in. Um, and this is the moment when reality and fantasy truly, <laughs> truly um, disintegrate <laughs> and she ends up in Glastown. Awesome. That, I'll stop there. Absolutely beautiful. Um, Thank you. That's fantastic. Tasha, if you could do a reading for us, and then I will open up to questions in the audience. Uh, I do have more that I want to ask, but I understand that I must not be selfish. <laughs> <laughs> I loved both of your readings so much. Oh, that art was lovely. Okay, um, to give you some context, uh, Heathcliff is obviously brown and is being treated as a servant and is treated very badly, whereas Kathy is white-passing, and as far as Kathy knows, Kathy is white. Heathcliff knows better. Um, so that just gives you a little bit of context for this section. Um, and this is from Heathcliff's perspective. I'm not doing the accent. Um, what do you call the sea, you asked suddenly? Me? I didn't open my eyes. I knew why you asked. The grass round us was bluish green, wind making it move like waters did in our dreams. Sea or ocean or water, same as you do. You knew other, word other words once. I know you did. I don't know them anymore. How could you forget? You didn't sound like you were accusing me. You sounded curious. Easy, I said. I wanted to. Then you went quiet. I felt you shift. You let my hair go. Don't get up, you said when I started moving. I'm making you a gift. 
I stayed still, maybe I slept, but I woke up proper when your hand got on my hair again, setting something on it. There, you said, pleased, I've made you a crown. I sat up and touched it. Heather crumpled against my fingers. I swore at you and you laughed. Careful, you giggled, careful, you're going to break it. Heathcliff, no, don't take it off. Later, I crept into your room. The two of us in your oak closet, sheets warm from your body and the smell of wood and lavender water all around us. You were already half asleep, so you just put your head on my chest when I lay back, listening to my heart, I think. Samudra, you whispered. Your voice was sleep thick, your eyes half open. Don't think you were really awake anymore. Are you dreaming, Kathy? I whispered back. That's what the seas called, you slurred, sighed, and sunk down against me. That's what I dreamed. I watched your eyes close, your breath go easy. I thought... Oh, Kathy, I thought right then we must have been made for each other. Maybe not on purpose. Don't know if I believe God's as kind or as cruel to do something like that. But the world wounded us both, maybe long before we were even born. And whatever wounds we had, they shaped us to fit each other. I put my fingers through yours. Even sleeping, you held me so tight, your nails left marks. We were both wounded and wild before you met the Lintons. You didn't pretend we weren't. But after, you were different. Me, still ragged, dirty, alone. And you, perfect. But you were always perfect to me, Kathy. Now you were perfect to everyone else. You prattled on and on about the Lintons, their big house, and how nice they were, all their fine food, and the way Mrs. Linton wore her hair. And you talked about Edgar Linton, told me how he followed you, how sweet he was, how he brought you gifts. You laughed over it. It made me jealous. Anything you want, I want for you. I always have, but that didn't stop me wishing you didn't want him. I asked you once when the anger got too high on me, and I couldn't stop myself. Does he know the truth about you? You frowned at me, confused. What truth, you asked. I stared at you. My mouth wouldn't move. How could you not know? When your parents were living, they didn't whisper as soft as they thought they did over India, didn't hide their worry over you and Hindley. And you and me, Kathy, we had words in common, words I must have learned from my father, words you must have learned somewhere from someone. Samudra, so you'd said to me, that was no thing you dreamed up. When we were out too long in the sun, your skin went golden, warm like brown bread, not burning. You knew your family had secrets and you had to keep them. You knew not to tell anyone about the chests of cloth and gold, trinkets from India locked up. You knew there was danger if you let anyone remember your family hadn't always been in the heights, in the same stone house high up on the moors. You knew there was a lie wrapped round you. You had to know. I kept staring at you. You stared back. Heathcliff, you said, sounding frustrated. I don't understand. I remember I turned away, looked down at my hands, felt shame run through me, a hot knife through butter. It's nothing, I muttered and stomped off. It took me a while after that to understand why I felt like I felt. You didn't want to know the truth, Kathy. Some part of you saw it the same way you saw ghosts and buried feathers and dreamed strange things. Some part of you knew that there was nowhere in you the same as there was in me, and you turned from it and pretended there wasn't. Wow. I hope you're recording the audiobook for that. Oh, no, it's already <laughs> done. I wasn't involved. <laughs> Never mind. Lost opportunity there. You read that beautifully. Um, so I'm going to turn to the audience if you have any questions. I don't know. Is there a roving mic? Yes, there is. Yeah, so if uh, audience members have questions... isn't a new thing hmm. because um, I don't know if any of you have read Rebecca by hmm. Daphne de Maurier. I mean, it's entirely influenced by Charlotte. Hmm. It, it, it's literally the same. And as we know, Daphne de Maurier was a huge fan. One of the things that this lady really should read, if you haven't, is um, Michael Stewart, a local author, wrote a book called Will I Am about six, seven years ago. And he explores what happens to Heathcliff in the years that he's missing. And he is black in the book, without a doubt. In my eyes, he's absolutely black. You know, there's no question. But Michael explores his origins and where he's come from. Um, really recommend that if you haven't read that. Um, one for you to look at. And finally, Isabel, I am so grateful that you released Glass Time just before lockdown because <laughs> In my Zoom call frazzled brain in my day job, I couldn't read hardly anything. 
your book was one of the things that kept me sane. Oh, Aww. thank you. <laughs> That's lovely. Oh, we have a question here. Thank you. I'm a bit concerned insofar as quite a lot of writers um, ride on the back of the Brontes and um, I'm pleased by lots of things that you've said today that you're not doing that. There are so many books. This lady just mentioned a book that I personally don't particularly like because people are trying to rewrite the Brontes. They're trying to say, well, Emily wanted to do that and Heathcliff did this and Mrs Fairfax did that. And, and it's all... None of it's true. None of it's... I don't really know how to put this. It's reinterpretation that isn't based on fact. But what you seem to be doing is reinterpreting in a much, much wider context and it's making sense. It, uh, do, do you understand what I'm trying to say? It's not, you're not storytelling. You're not making things up. You're using what the Brontes presented and, um, as you say, reimagining it in different parts of the world in current times. You're not making up stories as though you're a Bronte and you want to explain yourself. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I mean, we had a really fun conversation before we did the panel and we talked about what, what would the Brontes make of your books? And mm. I think there was a unanimous response that they'd hate it. Yeah. <laughs> I think we maybe, maybe we could that, talk about yeah. yeah. I mean, maybe we can talk a little bit about that. I think that's the same. I think Charlotte would have liked it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, then let's hear what the authors <laughs> would. Yeah. I mean. I think we, we get this conversation. Mm. Yeah, I, I think it's actually very worthwhile um, because we all feel very passionately about these books and about mm. the Brontes. Um, I, I really subscribe to Death of the Author because I think it isn't, uh, it isn't necessarily helpful for any of us to say this is what the Brontes would have wanted because we mm. can't know. Um, and and in, in many ways, and this sounds derogatory and it's not, I'm not interested in what they wanted and I don't because they are not interested in what I wanted. They're dead, I'm alive, you know, it's, it's, it's a whole thing. Um, but I think it's more interesting to look at the impact those books have had on, on um, literature as a wider thing so that we can explore those motifs because they're so resonant and they're so universal, like Shireen has done, um, or to look at the, the kind of the, uh, the, the narratives, um, the racialized narratives that have existed in fiction for, for now generations that the Brontes didn't invent but were part of, whether they intended to be or not, is not important. Um, what's interesting is to take those narratives and say, I want to play with this and do this. Um, would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I didn't actually... I, I felt awful, because when I was asked the question, what do you think they'd think of your work, I hadn't really thought about it at all. In fact, for me, it was nothing other than it being Charlotte Bronte's story. I didn't think of her as a person. I didn't think it wasn't... She wasn't in my mind. It was literally her plot. And like you said, the enduring legacy that the books have left behind. And they are just a real snapshot of that era and of women's lives and choices. And so I wanted to do that for, for our generation, for the generations that come. And I think there's so much room there for, for many other people to do that, that for me, it wasn't about what she would think or what her intention was. We know it sort of saved them in a way. You know, it was their escape, their therapy, their their way of explaining the world that they saw, and that's really how I felt about it. For me personally as well, when I finished writing and I wasn't roaming the fields of Palestine anymore, I didn't really know what to do. <laughs> so, you know, it wasn't for me about, about her as a person, but more mm. about what they left behind. Mm. Isabel, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I think... Um, when I said earlier as well that I do love... I love a BBC costume drama adaptation, but I think... There is an argument that says we've kind of reached saturation point with straight up adaptations, and I think it's exciting and brilliant to see the books through 
new eyes and new lenses and for new audiences and new generations because otherwise I think that things can become irrelevant. And mm -hmm. there are wonderfully relevant things in the Bronte's books. I'm, you know, they're, I think you said they're very human stories and I think we can all connect to the Bronte's. There's things about the Bronte's lives that we can all connect to. We've all experienced loneliness and we've, or you have a sibling or you've lost somebody and all those things they experience are deeply human but I think it's very important <coughs> and exciting to look at things in, in new ways. I think. 100%. Yeah. yeah, and it's their, um, you know, they, as a writer as well, it's their experiences as women writers, they were rejected. They had the worst reviews written about them. They had to <laughs> pretend to be men. And do you know what they did after those books? And I remind myself all the time, they went back into their room and they wrote another one. And I think for me, that was really key because as a writer, anyway, you know, it's... You, once your work's out there or even getting it out there, it's really, really hard. And what you have with the Brontes is this, it wasn't about fame or how many people wanted it. They wrote these books. I think Wuthering Heights was sold for £100 and they... And the publisher just sat with it. They didn't even publish it. Mm -hmm. And yet she went back and she wrote more books. And I think that's what was really inspiring for me. Writing was not for anybody else. It was for them. And mm. sort of to discover them later for the legacy that they've left is incredible because at the time, you know, you wouldn't call them successful. And they had it really, really hard. I mean, even their um, pseudonyms were, were men. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Do we have any other questions? Yep. One at the back and then we'll come over to the lady here. Hi. Um, I think what's so interesting about the remixing process is that what's happening is what's always happened in oral storytelling. In a world of oral storytelling, everybody takes the stories and does something with them. And it's absolutely what you're meant to do. And I think the power of the Bronte's creation is that they've become mythical and they've acquired the same kind of status that all absolutely mythical classic stories in the oral culture. And it is a tribute to the huge power of those stories that, that people feel impelled to take them up and continue their lifespan and keep them going and play with them. It's an absolute compliment, I think, to the power of the stories. And that is a very good point. Storytelling is mm -hmm. meant to be a, it's an oral tradition. And, you know, like you said, you take the story and then it will be changed slightly as you retell it. So I think that's a really great point. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, did anybody else want to respond? Or I realise we've got another question and little on time now. So, oh, yeah. that's good. so we'll take the other question. Um, it's just a question for Shireen. Um, Bertha Mason is a very problematic character in also, and there have been lots of interpretations of her. Um, sometimes as Jane Eyre's other angry self and I wonder, I don't know whether you've covered that character at all in your novel or whether you were tempted to or whether it was so problematic you left that concept out. Oh, so I missed the first bit. Is that the wife in the last? Yes. 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 <laughs> yeah, I left that out. Um, I, I felt that for my story, the other, the monster, whatever it is you want to call it, exists sort of uh, in a different way. Um, so actually, no, I didn't go near that bit. <laughs> but um, there are monsters in the story and um, but Yes, it wasn't. I, I did actually choose to leave that bit out. But good question. I was wondering if someone was going to ask me that one. I mean, if I could just piggyback off of that, um, there, there is a lot of, you know, they're gothic stories. There's, there is a lot of darkness. There's even, there's a lot of violence in, in these stories as well. And it was a question that I had um, for you guys. So emotionally and physically, you know, we're not spared when we're reading, reading the Brontes. So, and I was curious how each of you actually harnessed violence in your own work. Um, and that sort of darkness too. So sort of within the realms of this question, but just expanding it a little bit, a little bit out so we're not so focused on a particular character. Just sort of the darkness of the Brontes. Yeah. I think there's, for me, what I, there's so much death in their lives that I think it seeps into all of their books. And I think um, there's not uh, necessarily that much violence in my graphic novel mainly because I'm really bad at drawing fight scenes. <laughs> the problem with graphic novels is you have to be able to draw it if you want to write it. So, um, but I think what I wanted to try and get through was the melancholy 
equally. There's, mm. some, there's something poignant and beautiful and happy about the worlds they created, but there's also a contrast. Um, and I think when I read about the way that they describe Glastown, they describe it, Charlotte describes it somewhere as this um, technicolor world, or this, the, she talks about the blazing skies of Glastown. Mm. And that seems such a direct contrast to me um, to the kind of the colors of the moors, which are sort of purples and blues, and that it's not um, burning umber mm. very often. I mean, obviously, occasionally you get you get some red skies, <laughs> but I, and I think uh, I've totally lost track of the question. I'm so sorry. Yeah, but the harnessing the vibe, yeah, the, the sadness and the darkness mm. was the contrast between the real world and the fantasy world was something mm. that I wanted to draw. Mm. I got there in the end. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, for me, it was. Um, for the character, the, what they experience is, um, it, they have episodes of it. But for me, it was more about it being haunting, it being mm. a story of vulnerability. Mm. And, you know, when you have a, a, a young child or someone who's trying to make it against all odds, that really builds sort of an empathy mm. with the reader and the character. And, you know, it's, uh, it's part, again, of understanding their worlds. The violence for my character or what she experiences influences her decisions. And for the reader, it's that journey to understand why what happens at the end happens mm. because it's it's been that journey. Mm. Did you um, yeah, Wuthering Heights is really violent, mm. so uh, I couldn't write a remix without talking about alcoholism, gun mm. violence, um, familial domestic violence. Mm. All of that was in there, and it's it's handled very cavalierly in the original mm. book. So I kind of had to deal with people living in the midst of trauma where they've normalised trauma. Mm. Um, but also, because it's a young adult book, I kind of had to be like, and also this isn't normal. <laughs> um, but the, the funny thing about that is that then I had to read about real history, and then real history is horrible. Um, so uh, it, when I was looking at the East India Company angle and the impact that it had on their lives, I had to contend with the existence of the Bengal famine. One of them, there are quite a few. Um, and had to read about that famine and the way that the East India Company had exacerbated it and the, the potential death toll was anything to one to two-thirds of the population. Mm. Ridiculous, yeah. Mm. Um, so I had to bring that in and that kind of trauma into the story mm. um, and also the, um, the atrocities that were committed against Lascar. So, for example, there is a Lascar character in the book who talks about the fact that um, a third of the Lascar sailors were thrown overboard, which is a real thing that happened if mm. they... Um, didn't have enough food or supplies, or they just didn't want to pay for those men to return home, which they legally had to do and often didn't, they would throw them overboard mm. um, or force them to eat uh, beef or pork and uh, things like that. So it was, it was generally a lot of, um, a lot of violence. Mm. Um, and I think the way that I handled that was well, I didn't pretend it didn't exist. Mm. I did have it on page um, to some extent, but I tried to um, depict that with a sense of hope and possibility. So when you have trauma, you try and depict the possibility that people can escape the traumatic cycles that they're living in. Right. Um, because in the original Wuddling Heights, they don't. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to explore the possibility of something better. Mm, lovely. And on that hopeful, optimistic point, <laughs> <laughs> I'll end our discussion today. Thank you so much for being a brilliant audience, and please join me in thanking our authors. There will be a signing outside as well. So. <laughs>